<clears throat> why why does it say recording now in progress? <clears throat> Kristen, are you there? Hi, Tom. Can you hear me? I can. We don't want recording yet, though. Does anyone understand? Yeah, no, that? I understand that. Uh, who's on the normal Zoom? I thought I thought Kristen because uh, Kristen may not be on yet. So, we may be recording everybody. So just. Be careful what you say about Alan. <laughs> Only good things, I hope. <laughs> Hi, everyone. We're live already? Apparently. I don't know. Some somebody, For some reason, somebody says uh, uh, recording in progress. I don't know. I don't know why. Live already. OK. We can just mute ourselves for three minutes. Mm -hmm. I had a message that said the host wanted me to unmute. Did someone need something? We didn't want to be recorded at this time. We weren't ready what? to go live. Oh, okay. Okay, it is now seven o'clock on Wednesday, September 7th, 2022. I'd like to call this meeting of the Land Use and Building Management Committee of the Nora Common Council to order. Uh, with us tonight, we have council, member, council members, Barbara Smith, Greg Burnett, Heidi Alterman, David Hubelman, and Nicole Ayers. The only person missing is Mr. Meek. 
Okay, first, uh, next item on the agenda is public participation. Is there anyone who would like to speak to the committee? Tom, um, I, I get Chris, Chris is a call me. Somehow it's still not working well. She did everything she's supposed to do and she's not, I mean, we are on this meeting, but she can't, she doesn't have control over it somehow. So she's okay. a call do me. We, about it. Do we know if there's anybody who wants to speak? Uh, Hi, Chairman, I'm Livingston, Chairman Livingston, it appears somebody has their hand raised as a Diane. attendee. Okay, I'm just I'm just looking at that. Okay, um, okay, I guess I'll do that. Um, Diane, can you hear us? I don't know if I can. Diane, given permission. I'm trying to figure. It, it's not. I'm trying to see how I can do that. Um, hmm. I think if it's possible, if she could type in, um, if she had a question, she can type it in the chat and then you can answer it live. But if she has lots to say, that would be too hard. Yeah. Um, Diane, are you able to hear us at all? Can you send a text or anything or into the chat? And while we're waiting for Ms. Lauricella, uh, Mr. Meek has joined the meeting. Can you hear me, Tom? Yes, Brian, I can hear you. Thank you. Alan, are you able to talk to Chris? This is on the phone. Diane typed in, I can hear you. You can make me a panelist temporarily. Yeah, I'm kind of, where, where are you seeing that, Jim? Um, I, in the, uh, the Q&A, it popped up as a... Um, oh, gotcha. Um, I can't make her a panelist. I'm trying. We need whoever's in charge of this. Alan? Only hosts and panelists can see the question. Okay. Yeah, uh, Kristen says being recorded, but she can't. She can hear everybody, but she can't control. She can't control it. She, she can't make Miss Loricella a yeah. panelist. No, she can't. She's like, you hear everybody, but then she can't. She can't get in and control it. So, well, what well, she got in? I think there she is. Yeah. All oh, right. God. Okay, Diane. Sorry hey, that's the that. hope. I'm. Go ahead, Diane. Diane, can you hear us? You're, you're, go ahead and speak. Muted. You're muted. Okay. All right. And I will be leaving. I won't remain as a panelist. Thank you. Thank you for your efforts. Sorry. I love Zoom, but sometimes it's tough. Okay. Well, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have three quick, uh, uh, some questions and a thought. Number one, I read the email, the um, minutes with some great surprise, but before I send you all a, my comments about the minutes related to energy conservation, I missed that meeting. Can I, where could I get a list of the um, cap, capital improvement and the other list that uh, Mr. I guess Rennie and Mr. Miller had talked about? I didn't see that anywhere. And so I wanted to know, do I have to file a Freedom of Information request or can I get a copy of that from Alan or one of you? You don't have to answer it right now. I, I'll, I, have, I have two other quick questions. Okay, number two, um, related to uh, Tektron or Tekton Architects, the 2.76 million, uh, of course, there's a large change order percentage, uh, but you kept it actually lower, about $100,000. So I wanted to know, for all of these important building projects, has there been a running tally as to how often and how much these um, projects have to use change orders? And where could I find a running tally? Would it be through the finance 
department in, in concert with Mr. Lowe? Would it be through finance and claims or would it be through this particular committee? That's my second question. And then my third question quickly is relating to the cupola, as those of you that were on the council at the time, I questioned the large amount of money, over $100,000 spent. So I was asking, I would like to ask, uh, could, is there any way to save the twelve or $13,000 that is being asked for, uh, for to finish the job? And I look forward to hearing about why there's more money needed on this project. Some of you may think, well, in the big, we're a multi-million dollar budget, what's the big deal? Well, the big deal is twelve dollars to $13,000 could fund a consultant to help uh, some of our departments that are very low in in uh, a staff when they need it. $13,000 is a lot of money when you properly assign and task consultants to help staff uh, do specific work. So I think that um, I ask that you do not approve this. Um, I think the original ticket price was, maybe it was 150,000. I, I would love to know how much the original price was and why this is needed. So I thank you for your time. I hope my questions can be answered in some way. Thank you. Thank you, Diane. Is anybody else signed up to speak or like to speak? I don't see any other attendees. So with that, I'm going to assume there's nobody else signed up to speak. Does anyone have any comments that they've been asked to read into the record? All right, hearing none, I will close public participation and move to the approval of the minutes of the meeting of August 3rd, 2022. Do I have a motion? Mr. Burnett, thank you. Are there any comments or changes on those minutes? Seeing none, I'll call for a vote. All in favor of the minutes, indicate by raising your hand. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, uh, opposed? Abstentions? One abstention, Ms. Ayers abstains. Others are in favor, thank you. All right, no old business, moving into new business. First item is to review request from property owner at 201 Ely Avenue to acquire small abutting city property. Uh, in the event the committee considers the sale of the property, we would need to schedule a public hearing. Alan, you wanna to refer to that, talk about that? Yeah, uh, very quickly, it's 201 um, Ely Avenue. Uh, attached to the minute, that, I mean, attached to the agenda, there's a my cover memo and two letters from the, well, one from the requesting property owner and the other one's from the neighbor. It's a very slight, slight little piece of property you can, as you can see in the, in, the, uh, in the drawing on the site plan text map. Uh, it's really a tri triangular shape. It's about, I would say about 500 square feet and that's all it is. Uh, I have looked at it and there's really no reason for the city to keep it. Uh, so my staff recommendation is that the city would uh, uh, sell this property to the adjacent property owner. And uh, uh, in, in order to, to determine the price, we probably look into the, the uh, um, um, assessor's record to see what the assessed value per square foot is. And uh, from there, we would generate some numbers. Uh, but at this point, really, it's just the concept of selling the property, the city selling the property. If the committee do recommend that we look at this, then we will schedule a, meet, uh, a public hearing for next uh, at the next land use meeting. That's it. So, so we don't need uh, to have a price before we have a public hearing? No, we don't. It's just, it's just whether, I think that the word would be market value, uh, whatever that may be. Uh, it's we, we haven't negotiated the property, it's just really whether whether the city wants to reserve the, uh, we reserve the, the property for any, for any of our own purposes or we don't want to sell for any reasons. But it's really just, um, it's really want to sell the property and market value. Do we need to offer this to uh, do a public, uh, some sort of public notice and offer this to any resident or any? No, we don't. The, the reason being is that it's not a uh, <clears throat> buildable lot. So there's no value to, uh, uh, besides the two adjacent property owner, there's no value to anybody because you can't, you can't build on it. Okay, thank you. Brian? Uh, yeah, thanks, Sam. Um, I, I looked at this at a 50,000 foot level as like the city should have no business selling land. We need to buy land. But then looking at how small this thing was and the history of how they've been taking care of it, I, I feel like we should almost just give them the land 
Um, I maybe I'm in the minority there, but what, what, this isn't even 0.05 acres, right? Yeah, this is probably about 50 feet triangular shape, 50 by 22, so it's half. Uh, it's about 500 square feet. And they were maintaining this thing for like decades, and maybe way before then. It just seems like a no-brainer to let them buy it for whatever you guys assess it for. But I would just say give it to them. That's that's my two cents, and uh, I'll support the uh, transaction either way. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Barbara. Yeah, I had a similar reaction as you did, Brian. Um, it's so small. Uh, what I'm curious about, though, is the history of like how, how or why is it that the city owns such a tiny little corner of a lot in a residential area? Do we have any idea? No, um, <clears throat> I think the property only. No, I don't. Um, sometimes when I look at the map, I can see the potentials of roadway realignment and things like that. But this is pretty mm -hmm. straightforward. For some reason, <laughs> that little triangle is left out. I don't know why, how, and whatever. But uh, <clears throat> um, I think it is what it is at some point. Yeah, sometimes we see if it's a, if it was a paper roll or something, then we have to go away, go go through a roadway abandonment process. But this mm -hmm. doesn't look like that at all. So, okay. just curious. Yeah, I, I'm I'm in favor of selling it. I'm not not necessarily in favor of giving it to them because you know I don't know what sort of precedent that sets and whether we even could do it, but. Um, I also, yes, they've done a great job of maintaining it, but we don't know what's going to happen in the future. So anyway, my proposal would be to schedule that public hearing. I don't know how others feel about that. Okay, then, then I'm going to make a, a, a motion that we schedule a public hearing to consider the sale of the property uh, at 201 Ely Avenue at our next uh, regularly scheduled meeting. Uh, which would be uh, beginning of October. Okay, uh, all in favor? Okay, it is unanimous. Okay, thank you. All right, Jim, school pro construction projects update. Mike, you want to uh, share your screen? Uh, good evening, everyone. I'll, I'll start this off with the... Uh, the Jefferson School project. Um, uh, at, the, at this time, the, the students have moved back in and uh, school is in session at the Jefferson location. Um, there are minor repairs and adjustments that are being made by the construction manager for any items that have come up since they've moved in, you know, doors that aren't closing properly or other minor adjustments. And uh, the furniture delivery is about 95% complete. There's a couple pieces of furniture that we're still awaiting uh, that came in damage. So those are, you know, on order and just being fabricated and delivered and they should be here within the next couple of weeks. But other than that, uh, we've gotten a lot of positive feedback from the uh, staff uh, over there. And uh, it seems like it's going really well for them. Uh, just doing the closeout phase of the project now. And I just want to add other, one other thing is that <clears> we, have, we, we, we turned this building over in, uh, in the middle of summer. So the air, air, condition, air conditioning system has to be ran. Uh, we really won't fully close this project until we have to go for the heating season to make sure the heating system will get all the kinks out of the system. So, so as much as we're closing out, we still have a little bit of uh, uh, work to be done to, to, uh, to make sure everything works out as we turn the heat on. So, so Alan, where do things stand with solar in the building? Excuse me? Where are things with solar on the building? Oh, uh, last week, last week we were there, they were work, actually working on the roof. So uh, Mike, do you have any new information? I, I haven't oh, had been out there. That Tom, that project's being managed by the uh, Board of Ed, but they ha there have been, uh, their solar contractor, Green Skies, has been working there for uh, two or three weeks, I would say, at this point. So. I think they're getting real close to getting it done, but I can look into that and get you uh, an answer on that. Yeah. yeah, well, just let us know next week, next month, if you could. Okay, no problem. Thank you. Um, and then uh, moving to the Cranberry project. Um, at this at this point, the construction manager has completed all the, the foundation walls that are required for the project, and they're working on installing the underground plumbing and electrical. 
Uh, the building floor slab is scheduled to be uh, installed in the middle of September and structural steel will follow directly after that and run through the beginning of uh, November. Um, there's been a large coordination effort to coordinate all the mechanical, electrical, plumbing, fire protection systems that are going into the building. And uh, that's just about done and it'll be completed by the end of September. Um, the furniture and technology package uh, for the new school was presented and approved at the Board of Education Facilities Committee at their August meeting and referred to the Board of Education for their meeting last night. Um, and we also have an upcoming presentation following, I, I don't, maybe it's not right after this, but somewhere in the agenda tonight. And, it is after uh, this. Okay. Um, and then uh, once we get, provided we get your approval tonight, um, we'll just need to get a couple signatures and then uh, we have a meeting scheduled with uh, the Office of School Construction Grants on October 4th for final approval of the uh, furniture package. At that point, uh, we hope to get approval by them and uh, from them and go out to, to bid for the furniture for the building in early fall. And my feeling is that that'll help us secure uh, the best pricing we can for the furniture for the building. It worked out pretty well for us on Jefferson. We did the same uh, time frame of uh, appro state approval and purchase and, and it worked out well. We got favorable pricing. Can I just um, ask, do you um, do you have a delivery date for the structural steel and do you anticipate any delays? I know there's been a lot of problems with steel. Um, they haven't they haven't notified us of any delays yet. Uh, some of the some of the material is already fabricated and sitting in a, in a warehouse ready to be delivered to the site and installed. So uh, it's looking really good from that standpoint that we're not going to run into any delays with the steel. A lot of that material is fabricated, you know, right here here in Connecticut and then brought right to the site. So that's favorable and given the situation. And, and the uh, the other two the the other two material that's typically is a it's a little bit of a problem in today's uh, construction industry is roofing material and and electrical equipment. Uh, so we are monitoring those. I think electrical switches and stuff. I think they may be two weeks late right now, but we are we should be able to uh, recover those. That's two weeks. Uh, that's will come in sometime. I think it's April, March or April or something like that. Mike. Yeah. Yeah. And then. Uh... They're working with the roofing contractor to Allen's point now. Um, that looks like it may be around two weeks behind at this point. But when we set the project up, we kind of anticipated that we may run into roofing material delays similar to what happened at Jefferson. So there's a uh, contingency plan for that in that we can put a, uh, a different vapor barrier product on the roof that will allow the building to become watertight prior to all the final roofing material coming. So we're already covered from that end as far as the roofing material is concerned. And on this, on a side note, uh, <clears throat> I, I had mentioned this last meeting, well, we have actually issued a RFQ, RFP for a new solar, not necessarily a new solar, so for, for, for a uh, uh, PV uh, photovoltaic solar uh, um, developer or vendor. Um, and the RP went out, I believe it's a week and a half, two weeks ago, and uh, we are scheduled to get proposal part this week or early next week sometime. And we intend to bring, uh, it's for uh, Cranberry School, um, Knoll High School, and New so Sono School. Um, it's a two-step process. It's a RF, RF P, uh, I'm sorry, RQ for those, all three schools, but they're only submitting a proposal for Cranberry because Cranberry School is, on, is under construction. So we anticipate as soon as we fin finish construction, uh, we will have a contract, uh, Board of Education will have a contract with the solar vendor to install solar system on Cranberry School. So okay. it's always a, a post construction kind of uh, uh, installation. The reason being is that it, the, the, the solar system, the okay. vendor is, is, is being sec uh, sec secured through a power purchase agreement. So the city actually leasing the system and then we pay for the electricity that it generates, uh, which is less than what we buy from the grid. So uh, for the next, uh, for the October meeting, we are anticipating that we will submit a recommendation to the land use com committee and thereafter to the common council approval for a future vendor. 
It could be the same one as the current um, uh, current vendor. It's a, a current vendor is uh, Green Skies, uh, but they have comp completed three projects. So we thought that it's a good time to reissue these RP and see what is it, whether there's anybody else out there that would be interested that would be competitive with uh, Green Skies. Okay, thank you, uh, Brian. You had a question. Uh, no, I just like to report some secondhand news. You got a couple of a uh, couple hundred of free inspectors over there that are very excited about the progress. They watch the construction all day, and they're happy to report. They're happy to report the same things you did with the sidewalls going off, and uh, it's just it's a big pick for the kids. So uh, besides the disruptions, I think. Everybody's having a lot of fun with the whole thing, watching the progress. So um, good job and thank you. We got to get a daily report from them. <laughs> <laughs> I do every day. <laughs> they'll, keep, they'll keep Jim honest. Uh, I'll let you know when the steel's there as soon as the truck comes. Thank you. <laughs> and we're, we did, we're also... We're we did also, have a gra groundbreaking uh, uh, a few uh, two, uh, two weeks ago before school opens, the groundbreaking event. Um, and also, I, um, we may have a... Um, uh, topping ceremony is that when we finish finish the completion of the erection of the steel, the last piece of steel, a lot of time we have kids sign the names on it and stuff. We do more of a school event than a community event. Uh, so it's, uh, I think we're looking to do that. Um, right, Mike? Yeah. Mike, so we've got a bonus. Yeah. 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 A, beam will, a beam will be placed in the front of the school for all the kids to sign. And then we'll do a, a, a ceremony to install that. Yeah. I think Jen Mastone's going to put together a time capsule too. You guys can like bury in the wall. <laughs> I, can that cool. Al, I can put that Alan Lowe was here. Yeah. <laughs> there also, there right. also was a, there also was a uh, time lapse camera that the Board of Education installed on the roof of the existing building. So uh, you can actually visit the webpage and, and watch the time lapse of the building being constructed. So that'll be pretty cool when that, when the project's finished. That's great. Right. Um, here's a couple photos of just the on ongoing work there. Uh, on the left, just contractors installing underground conduits for electrical. This is uh, one of the electrical rooms. And then to the right, just the foundation walls are being backfilled at this point, and they're placing stone underneath where the new slab will be poured. And then that brings us to Norwalk well, just, High just School. Just before you get to it, we are on schedule, right? Yes. Yep. All right. All right. Good evening. I'll start with the Norwalk High School. Back in July, we finished the schematic design phase of the project. We're in design development right now, and that continues through December 2022. During this time, we continue to meet with school administration as well as facilities for feedback as the plans are updated and refined. Also, we have a standing weekly meeting with the architect as well as the uh, construction manager to uh, continue to coordinate the project. In August, we did meet with the state for our schematic design review meeting on August 16th. Uh, we meet with them again for the uh, design development review and that will take place in early 2023 after that phase of design has been completed and we've updated our estimate accordingly. And finally, last month, we did recommend a commissioning agent and that was approved and a contract was awarded to a commissioning agent for the project. Okay. I just want to up, <clears throat> just want to update everybody a little bit more. You see the photograph that's there, um, not photograph the uh, the rendering that's there now. Uh, we are looking at um, a further improvement on this design, especially the main entrance area, as well as the two side walls, one on the left, one on the right. <clears throat> so the architect has um, the further design on those areas. <clears throat> excuse me, the further design of those areas, and um, and um, I think we should have something pretty soon. I look at like four different rendition of it already. And uh, we are trying to look to um, get more character out of the main main entrance here because the one with one of the problems that the, the the classroom wings, which is a four story and the other side is three story, it kind of over overwhelms the, the main entrance a little bit. So we are trying to make the 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 um, the, the focal point, which is the main entrance, uh, a little more 
stands out a little bit more without spending a lot of money. So th that's that's our challenges. Uh, but anyway, so uh, we are, we are continue to look at the facade and try to improve further uh, since we're in the uh, design development stage. Okay. okay. So an update on South Norwalk Elementary School. The grant application was submitted to the state. We haven't received any additional feedback on that to date. Uh, the city did officially close on the property at One Meadow Street Extension on August 16th. We've, uh, from there, we've scheduled meetings with traffic, mobility, and transportation to discuss the needs of the neighborhood. Uh, regarding uh, roadways, entrances inside, into and out of the site, as well as sidewalks. And we will be including the transportation coordinator for Norwalk Public Schools to understand the uh, number of buses, parent drop-off, um, and as a neighborhood school, anticipating how many students will be walking to the new school. RFQs for architectural services were received last month, just before this uh, land use meeting. From there, the selection committee reviewed the qualifications, scheduled interviews with four of the most qualified respondents. From there, three of those uh, architectural firms were asked to provide an RFP with their total fee. And uh, we've reached a recommendation for that. And that's part of the land use meeting uh, agenda following this update on the recommended architectural firm. At the same time, uh, this past month, we've issued an RFQ for construction management. Those uh, qualifications were received on Tuesday the 6th. We received uh, seven uh, proposals, and we are beginning the same process where we'll evaluate those qualifications, invite contractors in for interviews, and eventually an RFP before making a final recommendation in October. Okay. And is that it? Are there any questions on any of the school projects before we move on? Okay, then let's move to item C, which is review and approve plans for the furniture, fixtures, and equipment, right? FFE for Cranberry School for submission to the state. The Common Council approval is not required. Uh, the motion is to authorize the chairman of the city of Norwalk Land Use and Building Management Committee of the Norwalk Common Council, designated by city ordinances as the official Norwalk School Building Committee, to certify the city of Norwalk Land Use and Building Management Committee's approval of final plans, project manual, and cost estimate for state project 103-0252N, Cranberry School Elementary, Cranberry Elementary School FF and E. FF and e phase two of two. Do I have a motion? No. Oh. Someone want, thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Okay, we've heard a little bit about this. Alan, you want to fill us would in? Be, uh, it would be Mike and Lisa that would be presenting. Yeah. Okay. So so we have a, a little presentation uh, tonight for, for you guys. Um, you know, this is just a procedural item for the state. You guys, we look at the final plan specifications and cost estimate for the project. Um, so we, we, they've developed a little bit of a presentation to show you some of the furniture that was selected and some of the costs that are associated with that furniture. And, uh, you know, not to take the thunder away, but the project is uh, uh, on budget currently and uh, we'll be looking to go to the state, like I had said previously, in uh, early October to get their approval. So uh, we have... Lisa Yates from Antonazzi Associates, who's the uh, project manager for the Cranberry Project, and uh, Lauren Williams, who's uh, part of the interior design team at Antonazzi, uh, joining us to give that presentation. So with that being said, Lisa, if you wanna go into it, thank you for joining us. Sure, hi everybody. So as, as Mike said, I'll do a quick introduction. I'll present some of the numbers, um, lead us back into the plan, and then Lauren will walk us through a few furniture highlights. So as Mike said, um, we are on budget. This number, the 1.260 number, is actually, I think, $1,000 less than our original ideal budget. And it, it, it includes um, you know, technology that's not part of construction, as well as um, furniture, fixtures, and equipment. 
So first, this is a quick rundown of the technology portion. Um, network switches for the computer system, phone system, digital signage, which are some, some LED screens, um, the visitor management system, so the Raptor, and some charging stations. We are, uh, this is Mark D'Agostino, D'Agostino Associates, Associates is working on this. And um, this is very, very similar to what we had at Jefferson and also PONUS. Um, for this estimate, we're carrying a 4% contingency, which Mark has worked with the vendors and things are, things are pretty settled here. We feel good about that number. And then this is furniture, fixtures and equipment. Uh, also, we're, we're carrying a 5% contingency on this, but also uh, working with the vendors, we're building additional contingency in to each individual item based on, so we have a lot more volatility with furniture these days than we did, uh, say, two years ago. So we're trying to protect your budget against that by being somewhat conservative. And as part of that, in, in furniture, we have introduced some alternates, which are sort of common for construction, a little less common for furniture. But the idea is if we've been overly conservative, we can we can get this stuff back very easily. And that's what we're exactly what we're hoping and planning for. So these four alternates shown here are add alternates. The classroom furniture consists of there was an additional table that was requested by the school late in the in the process. Um, in each classroom so that this covers that. Um, there's a single large piece in the library which we're isolating so that we have that flexibility. Um, few, a few items in the gym and there was some uh, additional music storage furniture that was also requested later. So, so we isolated these items and then if the, the piece of, of library furniture comes back, there's a more modest package here that comes out of the base bid to compensate for that. So that should that should keep us where we want to be when the bids come in. And then th these, this is the floor plan. You know it well. Um, you know since we're well into construction, and I know the project's been getting a lot of attention. Uh, this version shows the furniture, uh, and you know as it as it's always been, we have sort of our civic wing here on the south side. So this is the, the cafeteria area over here, the admin wing right next to the entrance and our gymnasium all surrounding this lobby, which can be locked off from the academic wing. And then Lauren will take us through the classrooms, the pre-K, the kindergarten, and then we have first and second grade on this floor. Our learning commons is here, the heart of the school. Um, and we have the what they call the specials. We have art and music. Uh, this is actually potential swing space for second grade in the main music room here. And then on the second floor, we have the upper grades, third grade, fourth grade, and fifth grade. Um, science classroom and the resource classroom are both to add more flexibility. And we have our resource classrooms on this sort of these narrower rooms that form this little spine on the other side. So with that, I will turn it over to Lauren. She can tell you more about the furniture. Thanks, Lisa. So um, we're going to start off in the pre-K classroom. Um, we took some of the cranberry teachers out to Jefferson and they were able to see actually a lot of the furniture because we are creating some sort of like Norwalk standards. So a lot of the furniture we're proposing is actually very similar to Jefferson's. So um, in here, you can see that we have the standard teacher desk and um, teacher chair. We have the uh, classroom rug. Um, down at the bottom for the students to sit on, and then a big book easel um, for you know the larger books for the preschool uh, pre pre K class uh, students. And then um, up in the right hand corner, there are just examples of the different play things, you know, uh, bookcases, a climbing tower, play kitchen, different things like that for the pre K class students. Mm -hmm. um, All small and yep. Yeah. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. On the previous slide. Um, you show two things. Is each one of these classrooms for the kindergartens or pre-K are typical two things? Are they same heights or the different heights? So this is um, just for pre-K and they have two sinks at two different heights for the pre-K because the students are slightly um, shorter and then then like your standard height. Um, but that's just for pre-K. Thank you. Kindergarten only has one. 
And then kindergarten through second grade, um, you have height adjustable desks. Um, right, yep. And then they'll be set like at a lower height for different grades. Um, and then the student chairs, um, student and teacher cubbies. Um, we do have a mobile um, easel and chart paper um, piece, right? Yep, Lisa's pointing to. But um, at Cranberry, we do have whiteboards attached to the walls. Um, so this is not their only whiteboard in the space. And then we have the standard teacher desk and the classroom rug, and then also that um, table that the teachers requested, um, like Lisa mentioned later in the game. And then if we go to third through fifth, it's the same furniture. It's just set at different heights for the um, height appropriate for the students. So, yeah. And then in the learning commons, um, this is just a rendering. It's not exactly what is being um, pr provided, but just to give a general idea of what the learning commons will look like. Go to the next one. These are the pieces of furniture. So you have starting from the left to the right, we have um, it's actually a double sided bookcase um, up the top left. Then if you move over to the right, you have um, it's like a structured chair that's low to the ground that's easy for the younger students to climb onto. Um, we have stools that'll sit behind this larger piece yep, that Lisa's pointing to. Um, it's great for you know casual gatherings, class classroom setting, things like that. We have um, a stool that has a handle on the back that students can move around. And then if you go underneath it, there's another chair that's called the mitt chair. More soft seating for the students to you know, read books or things like that. We have um, leaf chairs. And then for the classroom setting part of the learning commons, we have these large wood tables with, um, they'll have the chair above it, which is in the green, but the bench is actually just an accessory for the teacher's table for students to come up and ask questions. And then um, in other instructional spaces, such as the resource room, other classrooms like the um, specialty classrooms, we have um, the half round uh, shaped tables and the student chairs right next to it, that mobile chart, paper, and easel, the standard teacher desk and chair, and then additional types of um, storage, which is you know the filing cabinets and cubbies. And then some of these classrooms up on the second floor are actually larger classrooms that are providing some flexibility where we have these screens that can divide them into two smaller classrooms, or they can close the screen and be one larger classroom depending on the needs um, you know, of the future. So that provides that. And then in the cafeteria and the teacher's lounge, um, over on the left-hand side, we have the teacher's lounge table, just a nice table with um, a laminate wood top. And then, um, the teacher's chairs and then to the right yep yeah, and then to the right we have the foldable uh round tables and then the um uh, cafeteria chairs and then um there's the buddy bench which is a specialty if they earn this ability to be able to sit at this you know soft seating table bench like table with um fun fabric and things like that the administration suite um, we have, this is an example of the principal and site director's um, table or desk and then their uh, chair and their guest chairs. And then the principal actually has a separate table in her space um, so she can have more, you know, converse, casual conversations with people and then additional storage. And then on the left-hand side, we have the conference table and then the conference credenza, which is in the room conference room that helps, you know, hold technology and other things like that. And that wraps up our highlights. Uh, we're happy to answer any questions you might have. Are there any questions? No, well, looks great. Thank you. All right, seeing no questions. Uh, if you can clear the screen so I can see everybody, thank you. I will then call for a vote. Uh, all in favor, in favor, raise your hand. Two, three. Right. Opposed? Uh, no one's opposed. Uh, Mr. Burnett, by the way, had to leave the meeting. So um, I guess we are six in favor. So we'll pass it unanimously. Okay, thank you. Great. Thank you. Have, have a good night. Uh, Tom? Yes. Uh, Mike, <clears throat> Mike's going to reach out to you probably later on this week or next week to have the have sign you thing. Out. Yeah, just let me know. I can okay. come by. Thanks, Tom. Yep. Um, okay.
Item D, review recommendation on the selection of the South Norwalk Elementary School architect. Refer the following to the Common Council for Action. A, authorize the mayor, Harry W. Rilling, to execute an agreement with Tecton Architects to provide architectural design services for the South Norwalk Elementary School project for a total not to exceed $2,756,981, account noted, and B, authorize the Office of Building Management to execute change orders on contract for additional design services for a total not to exceed $100,000, account noted. No a motion? Anyone? Uh, thank you, Ms. Smith. Okay, Alan. Yeah, um, I think Dan is going to go into detail of the uh, <clears throat> the submission and, and the recommendation, but I just want to very quickly, uh, we advertise the RP for, for uh, <clears throat> excuse me, um, for potential architecture firm to submit proposals. And we created a, a committee for evaluation because there, right now there is no school. So uh, we are two members of Board of Education and Sandra from, from Board of Assistant Superintendent. Uh, so the three member board, of education joined uh, was part of the committee. On the city side, we have Tom and uh, uh, um, Arlene. Darlene, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> As more, member of Common Council, and I'm the staff person from the city side. And we also added Sharon Connor, who's the uh, uh, purchasing agent. So there's seven of us uh, that conducted the interviews. So with that, um, Dan, you can go into a little detail in, about the process and, and the, uh, uh, the reasons why we recommended te Tecton. Okay, thank you, Alan. So the memo that was included with the uh, agenda for this meeting, it goes through the history of this project, where the funding came from, what the goals were, and how they were going to be achieved. Uh, it, after walking through that, it gets us to the point where we've acquired the property, and the next step is to get an architect on board to help design the project. So with that, we went out for RFQs, uh, a request for qualifications on July 12th. We received nine RFQs back. We evaluated those. And as Alan uh, stated, the, the breakdown of the selection committee, we uh, met, reviewed those qualifications together and shortlisted four of those firms that would come in for uh, an in-person interview. The four firms were did an in-person interview, uh, were evaluated based on the quality and content of that, uh, inf that interview. Uh, from there, three were asked to provide an RFP, which is their final and total fee for the project. And in this memo, we, we listed out the four shortlisted firms, as well as their interview rank. We at the end of the day, based on the qualifications, quality of the interview and the fee proposals, uh, Tecton was the recommended architect for the project. They were the first ranked interview uh, and the second ranked total fee uh, by a difference of approximately $7,000. Uh, but based on the other qualities and information that they provided, we felt they would be the best fit for this project. And they uh, had a, a very heavy emphasis on the neighborhood and community aspect. And that was important to the South Norwalk Elementary School and getting us to the finish line on this project. Yeah, I'd, I'll just add to that being a member of the committee. I think we were all very impressed with their focus on the community, as Dan said. and their, desire to integrate them in, into not only design of the building and public spaces, as well as how it fits in the whole community. So that was really impressive. The other, any, any of the four firms could have done the work, but these guys really shine when it came to this, this part of the process. Any questions on this? Barbara? Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I uh, had a similar reaction reading the backup and, you know, their, um, their approach. I was really impressed with it. And I think it's exactly what we need for um, this particular school. Um, I'm curious, do we have any experience with this, um, with these architects here in Norwalk? Have they worked on any of our schools? No, they have not. <clears throat> Uh, but Jim, uh, Jim, um, just for information as well, uh, Jim Giuliano, who's, who's uh, you know, who's the, I guess, principal of uh, his company, 
uh, he he works with this uh, this architecture arch firm in other places. So maybe Jim can say a few words, but it's a little bit sensitive because he is working with them and also as well the other firms as well. So Jim, may you want to add a little bit more to this? Yeah, sure. Um, we are, as Alan said, <clears throat> we uh, uh, are managing multiple projects uh, and have managed projects in the past where uh, we have worked with Tecton um, and we've done some uh, from from uh, building schools to also doing um, feasibility studies and reports. So uh, we have a good experience with them, uh, worked with them on numerous projects um, and not only uh, work with Tecton, but their um, project manager, Eddie Wadowski, uh, I've worked with uh, when he was at another firm, um, top notch, uh, knows uh, the office school construction grants uh, very well and uh, will manage this project um, uh, judiciously. So, um, you know, it was a good selection, as well as, you know, the other firms were, were uh, good as well. But um, so. Okay. Just, yeah, just, just impressed yeah. with their holistic approach. Yeah, just as a side note for people who haven't been involved in this before, and, and one of the reasons that a couple of the firms, those nine firms were not selected for further review is, is familiarity with the Office of School Construction in the state. And it is critical that whoever we select has that familiarity, knows how to work with them, and has worked with them. So that's just so people who haven't been in the process before know how, but that is one of the most significant criteria of these firms. Anyway, Brian. Yeah, thanks, Tom. So, so um, first off, so I'm going to vote against this, uh, regardless of your answers here, but I, I would like to know a little more. When when you say the full history of the project is outlined in the project, I, and I think maybe because I'm a little new here, I don't have all the details of that, but does, does the full history uh, encapsulate the efforts to get a, a school built up the hill at Springwood Park? And, and if it doesn't, that's fine. I just don't understand what full history means. Um, second, um, once the architects are selected, I, I, at least I would hope, and maybe not, um, you know, I don't know how these things go, but are, are we gonna get, is it gonna start off first with a topographical analysis of the property, um, some core samples? I mean, it's, you don't have to be an engineer, right? You walk down there, the the whole uh, scope of that property is filled with ledge, and I don't think any of these. Uh, I don't think we had core samples going into the purchase of the property. Uh, so there's that. And then was there any analysis of the truck traffic done? I mean, diesel trucks probably uh, between the school bus, uh, sorry, wheels bus depot, school bus depot, all the way down to city carting. We're talking probably about 500 diesel trucks starting up every morning down there every day, right, you know, within um, stone's throw of the property. Are, are, are these some of the factors that are gonna be considered when you're looking at this initially, you know, before drawing out full plans? So I, I would like to have some answers to those questions. Thank you. I guess I just, maybe, I'll, maybe I'll start. Um, a few things. Um, the first one is that when we acquired the property, um, we did a typically as required, we would do we do a phase one environmental analysis. And for this project, we got permission again as property to do a phase two. A phase one is really a historic evaluation of uh, you know what type of building, what kind of uses on the property before that. And phase two is actually go out and get samples. So we were able to do test fits uh, and coring samples, uh, which go down uh, to, to sometimes we, we, you know, call, call, call material to test for the soil condition to see any contaminants on the, in the grounds, as well as the water table. Um, there are a couple of, the, couple of original core that we we're gonna do. Uh, we didn't do it because it's like we hit ledge pretty, pretty, pretty shallow area. So it's not, I mean, I should, like you said, we are aware of ledge areas and stuff, but there's no, for geotechnical. As part of this architecture services, we do have an allowance set aside for geotechnical evaluation. Jim, can you fill me in or fill everybody else in, in on that a little bit detail? Uh, sure. So 
um, geotechnical investigation and uh, also um, construction administration as part of, as an allowance, as Alan said, um, the architect's responsibility uh, to do an evaluation of the site. Um, and that uh, may include or could include um, both um, test pits as well as core samples um, to find out the depth, uh, the, you know, the actual depth of um, ledge. Um, as Alan said, you know, we have done uh, from an environmental perspective, we have done some core sampling out there. Um, and we may have done a couple of small test pits as well uh, when we we're doing that phase two investigation. And we did hit ledge in some areas where we expected to, um, you know, and we do, you know, uh, Brian, I mean, the, you know that, that there's an 80 foot difference, I think between, uh, uh, you know, the front of the uh, property to the back of the property. And it's pretty obvious that there is ledge there. Um, the, some of the architects, when uh, we had an interview, used that to their advantage uh, for the design of the project. Um, so, you know, I don't find or don't feel that it will be an impediment to the design or the use of the site. And, and also the, um, I think just like in all high school, when we do test it, it's really is when you went, when beginning to narrow down the configuration of the building and roughly where we want to put the building, uh, that's when the the geotechnical test volume is more important because you can you know you can think you can do twenty test bits out there. Uh, they're not the location we put in the footing. <laughs> so as soon as we start through the initial designing phase, we understand where we're going to put the building exactly, and and, and roughly where those footing is. That's where we start doing more more specific uh, test borings. Um, Hitting ledge is not the biggest problem. It typically, it's when you have soft, so, soft grounds. That's when there's more a problem. I mean, you can modify the footing. You can, you can, you know, you can jackhammer. You can, you can, uh, um, you can do ledge removal and stuff. But when if you hit soft ground, it's a bigger problem because you got you got dry piles and stuff. So, so uh, no property is perfect. You know, uh, it's not unusual. Even in Pona School, when we build it, uh, we actually had to do a little blasting. Uh, very controlled blasting. I mean, the kids are still in school. It's very well controlled. It's all is like a boom. That's it. So, so we have to blast in the area a little bit and things like that. So it's not usually hit ledge. And and the, usually the concern is soft material because now you can excavate a lot of material and you got to dispose of it because it's uh, you know very clay and stuff and you can't really use it for for backfill material and stuff like that. So it's a uh, it's a uh, you know each one has its own challenges. Uh, but at the same time, it's that. Uh, uh, we are expecting that we're gonna we got we gotta design the footing around <coughs> around integrated into the ledge where we find them. And, and also we have as far as the after services, uh, we have allowance for traffic study. Uh, we are, there's two component of our study. One is like for the object, we will go through a traffic analysis uh, of the different intersections uh, and and the bus and the and the parent drop off area and stuff. And, and, and the secondary, not secondary, uh, concurrently, we work in the traffic and mobility division to look at uh, sidewalks and neighborhood improvements. And uh, I, we have a $1.5 million allocated for sidewalk improvement. And that's probably will happen next year. And then we will continue to look at how to extend beyond the immediate school to further out and further out. So that we multi multi-year phase evaluation of where we're going to go in the future. But we need to sit down with, um, uh, traffic mobility. We scheduled a meeting last week, but we couldn't. Uh, there was um, scheduling issues, so we probably scheduled for, uh, that meeting for probably next week. Uh, okay, Alan and Jim, that that's a lot to unpack, and thanks. And um, I do have a couple of follow-ups, but I I do see um, Nicole's in front of me. I'd like to come back after her, if that's okay, Tom. Yeah, sure, sure. Nikki, thank you, um, Council. Okay, thank you. My question is just if we could please um, speak with the architect. I know we're voting on who um, we're picking, but whomever the final choice is, because we are aware of the um, composition of this neighborhood and where this school is located, can we possibly ask for more green? more trees, more plants to try to um, help 
with some of the things that may be solved down the road, but will be there when this school opens. So um, I hope that whomever is corresponding and talking with the architect to really emphasize the fact that this particular school is going to need more of those green things that will help combat some of the natural um, pollutants that are in the proximity of the school. So more of a comment, not necessarily a question. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Brian, follow up. Thanks. And, and, and sorry for my earlier run on sentence. And I don't know if, if that was Dan from CSG that mentioned it, but, um, and sorry, Dan, I'm, I'm a little new here coming on board, but someone had mentioned that there was a full history of the project outlined to the committee or, or somewhere else. And maybe if I could have a copy of that, a lot of this will go away, but I, I was just curious, does that full history include um, the effort and the tremendous expense that the city went through to try to locate a school at the Ingalls Avenue property on Springwood Park that would have been open today with students in it for half the cost, not along the main corridor of the, of the bus depots and everything else. So I, I, I don't know what happened here. It's a gap between when I investigated that spot in 2015 and the school board and today. And I, I would just like to be filled in about that so I could feel a lot better about this project. Thank you. Sure. Uh, let, um, uh, Brian, let me respond to you. Um, as you probably see, mo most of the memo that come to the land use committee is under my name. Uh, I wrote part of those those memos, and, and Dan will sometimes Dan or Jim or, or Mike will, will draft something for me, and we to get uh, together. It's under you know it's under my name when these memos are issued. Um, I think for the for the the original concept of Columbus School going to going to Ely sites probably started like five years ago. And we come to the land use committee uh, regularly and, and, and sometimes even executive session to talk about where you kind of real estate issues and, and acquisition issues and things like that. Um, it's really an evolution of a project that was not successful because of the pop use restriction. Um, and as we move forward, when we write these memo, we start dropping off some of the old history because I mean, th that portion of it could take like, you know, a page or two. So we don't want to repeat the same thing over and over again. Um, so, so it's, uh, it's, it's kind of like, so when, we, when I, we put this memo together, we take the perspective that um, the Columbus School at Ely site, it's behind us. So that's why you don't see any history about the past. Uh, but I'm, I'm happy and, you know, we can pull some of the old, a little more detailed information for it. So it's all we can, me and you can sit down and just go over this together. So we kind of take the, we, with, with the approval of South North School project, we kind of started a new page, a new chapter on this on a South North School instead of Columbus School. Uh, this is a new South North School. So we didn't want to bring this history back every time. Again, again, take up a page to go over what the history was. So that's why you're not seeing the detail of the past so much. So, um, and it's really, and as we move forward, you know, after we go through the design phases, we, you know, selection octet becomes a, a past history also. So, so there's, there's the amount of information we give each memo. And then again, it's, it's just, just kind of bring people to date, but doesn't mean that we go all the way back. So I understand that council member changes, board member changes. So anytime you need more, a little more history and information, how, what worked, what didn't work, we you welcome. We, we I can sit down with you and go over it specifically, or I can I can draft some, put some some memos together to the whole committee as well. Yeah, let, yeah, let me thanks. suggest that you guys you know get together, sit down. I'll be glad to participate if you want, but um, just to sit down and get your questions answered, all, all your questions. Yeah. Answered. Okay. Well, because, you know, I mean, we, we have uh, a million dollar in eminent domain acquisition up there from uh, the Bonadio property. We have two million dollars in plans that are fully architected down to the down to the tiles, the texture and colors of that building. I, I, I hope that, you know, we need five more schools in South Norwalk and that's one that can eventually happen and we could leverage that sunk cost that right now today looks like we're never gonna get back except for a land swap consideration of property that never happened. And here all of a sudden you have 12 acres of land and is there an opportunity to go reapply for the Ely school 
at a 60% reimbursement rate and have kids in a park-like setting instead of on a, a main corridor of trucks, garbage trucks. I've heard uh, compatriots of mine ask if we can move city carting. Well, where the hell are you going to move that? Is it Wilton? Where are you going to... Where are you going to move all this stuff to make a nice neighborhood school for these kids? Has anyone ever looked at looking at a land swap of some of this brand new 11 acres at Hatch and Bailey? Make that into a park and dust off the plans we had up at Springwood and and, and make a good thing happen and make it happen a lot quicker. Um, you know, I, I don't think you can divorce one from the other. Uh, you know, it's just it's constantly moving the, you know, moving the goalposts out on, on South Norwalk, who's needed a school for five decades. We would have had a school open today with children in it, in a park-like setting without 500 trucks driving through it. And five years from now, well, we're just going to have to guess what happens. We're going to have to fix the sidewalk, maybe. We're going to have to relocate city carting. I still don't even know where you move that. Where do you move that? Wilton? Are they going to take it? Where are you going to move that? Are you going to put 5,000 trucks on the highway with garbage up to Bridgeport? I, I just feel like there's so many questions to be answered here before we just dump another $5 million into plans and another council comes in behind me, you, and everyone else and says, no, we're not going to do it. And then South Norwalk gets screwed again. I'm sorry, I'll get off my soapbox, but this is very important to me. Thank you. Okay. Heidi. Hi, thank you. Um, I just had a brief question. I was wondering with the, you know, possible toxicity in the soil, um, if anybody had considered micro remediation, myco remediation, um, you know, to help remove some of the toxins from the soil. Uh, the, can you respond? The, I don't know where. Uh, Pardon me, but sounds a little, little direct. But we didn't find any toxin on the property, right? So, so we consider we the environmental. We have two environmental scientists look at this property, and through this even soil sampling, what we find was that for industrial site, any property actually in South Norwalk, this is one of the cleanest property anybody can find, generally speaking. The only thing that's two level, I think there's two samples or one sample that came a little high, a um, little above it. It's not, it's not, it's not like hazardous material. It's it's something with metals or something that could be naturally occurring. And the, the the analysis was that the material can be left on site if you move it and put it in a foundation. So I don't want to. I just want to make sure that we got the terminology correct in the sense that. We didn't find any contamination, uh, you know, whether it's fuel oil or some kind of manufactured chemical and things like that. There's nothing like that on the property. So, so I, I didn't want to miss, in case the public's listening to this, uh, I didn't want to mislead, mislead them that they are, this site is by, by any means toxic at all. It's actually very, very clean for, for, for sub normal property. It's clean for any property. Okay. You okay, Heidi? Is it okay? Okay, Barbara. Um. Yeah, I just wanted to, um, you know, just address Brian. Are you still there? Um, <laughs> yeah. Sure. Just to reiterate that, uh, you you definitely should sit down with uh with Alan to get the whole history of this. But just um to just say uh that it was the state uh deep that put the kibosh on the project. Yeah, re respectfully, the land, restrict, the land restriction requirement is BS. Uh, Bridgeport High School is being built on six, six acres of land. So the fact we couldn't build because we didn't have 10 acres, but only had nine, the state can do what they want. They do what they want, whenever they want, wherever they want. There are schools all across the state on much less than 10, 10 acres of land. So whatever they sold us is a pile. And maybe Alan can change my mind. But, I think Alan uh, can fill you in. Yeah, well, why, why don't you have that discussion with Alan? If you have more questions, we can talk. No, I'm stressed out. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're not going to have it tonight, Alan. All right. Any, any other comments? I know Alan that? from the 90s, so we're, we're good. <laughs> we're good. He's, a, he's our guy, always. Yeah, he is. 
And he worked extremely hard to make that that school come to fruition and was not successful. So um, he made every effort. Anyway. I know. And, so, and Medard as well needs to be recognized for hours poured down the drain. Yeah. All right. Uh, if there's no other comment, I will call for a vote on this item. All in favor, indicate by raising their hand. Okay. Opposed? Okay. Mr. Meek is opposed. The rest of the council and the committee is in favor. So six to, uh, five to one. Okay, moving on to item uh, E, review request to increase construction contingency for the city hall cupola repair and painting project and refer the following to common counts for action, authorized to increase the contingency on contract with GL Capasso Inc for city hall cupola repair and painting project for an additional $12,927.97. Account noted. Do I have a motion? Anyone? Uh, thank you, Ms. Harris. Alan? Yeah, um, I just want to um, start out by talking a little bit about contingency, since it was brought out at the public session by Diane. Um, I think typically for, for school construction project, building management project, and, and, and a board, board uh, uh, parks department project, DVD projects, uh, we typically ask for 10% for, for contingency for construction. Um, and allow the department to, to, to implement any changes during construction within that limit. So I, I have to, my belief is that probably one or 30 projects will come back to a council for additional funding for various, various reasons. Sometimes it's construction and no material, uh, and known conditions. Sometimes it's really just changing the scope. Um, and I think for, for, for just step back a little bit, for school construction, major building, we typically ask for 5% contingency. So we don't typically ask for 10%. Uh, architectural service is a little bit different, uh, but in terms of construction wise, we maintain about 5% contingency for owner contingency. Uh, for historic, uh, not historic building, for, uh, for building renovation, we probably do a 7%, assuming the money is available in the budget to cover 7% or 8% contingency. Uh, other than that, typically it's five versus a 10% for, for, for you know, bridges and, and, and drainage projects and park improvements. Um, so specifically to the uh, City Hall Cupola, it's a, the cupola, as you all know, it's, um, it's kind of one of the architecture feature or, or landmark for the city even though it's not designated historic, uh, it is a focal point of the community and it's part of City Hall and Council Hall. It's built in 1930s. It's fully wood and with copper flashing at different locations. You probably don't see that because it's a it's different, you know, it's different different areas, sometimes on the floor and things like that. Um, because it's wood, and these woods, the 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 wood is, I mean, that's why I include some picture of uh, you know what's from the ground level, you don't see all the detail, but you can see some of these pictures. Um, these, even the balusters, I mean, they, 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 they're wood, they crack and all. So every 10 years or so, we have to go out and paint it. Um, the last time we went out to paint it, we actually, we actually like took the paint down all the way to bare wood. So you can see actually some of the picture that we did last time. So that we don't have to deal with lead, lead base, base paint and uh, uh, disposal every time we do this. So we get down to bare wood so we don't have to do it again. Uh, but every every ten years or so, we go up there. Last time when we did the project, I think it's two hundred some thousand dollars. But I talked to the contractor at the time. Renting the scaffolding costs us about thirty five thousand dollars for the duration. That's how much it cost last time. So just getting up there is is a, is a challenge. So when we go up there to do repairs, so when we find wood that crack, we will we will we will fill it and all. But after after 10, 20 years, that piece of wood eventually will have to be replaced. So there's always more work and more work afterward. Um, <clears throat> so there's a decision to be made how much of this improvement that we do replacement, we, we go into uh, like, like uh, uh, PVC, uh, which is plastic, which is like uh, tracks, uh, not tracks, uh, ASAC um, type of material to replace it. But it's not true restoration. It's really, it's a, you know, it's renovation kind of thing. So there's some little debate internally about how much of this and uh, we would use plastic wood uh, for replacement. But certain pieces, like you can't mill it that way except with wood, because there's curvatures and things like that. So for, for back to the current project, um, 
we have contingency allocated for this project. And as we go up there and we start, you know, there's original picture when the architect took it. And by the time we whip out, whip, whip out those pieces, there's more damage and things like that. And also we included painting a lower portion of the cupola that wasn't in the orig original scope. So all in all, we needed, I think it's, uh, you know, I wrote this, I got this memo, like wrote this memo like last week. So I think it's $12,000 more uh, to finish this project. So, so I have, I have two comments. One, the picture in my background is now from the cupola, uh, but I don't think anybody's ever done a home construction project where there hasn't been some additional cost they weren't anticipating. And this seems rather small cost. Uh, Nikki, you got a comment or question? Um, I, Alan, I just want to make sure I understood you or heard you correctly. You're saying that in some of the original woodwork, you're now going to replace it with another material, not wood. Did I hear that correctly? No, we haven't. We have not. Okay. You so, have not. So you've right. got to keep so, the, the wood that was there. Wood, right, right. But it has to be um, very hot wood that we, they have to like custom mill it. So they, we actually take pieces off and they bring it to a, a, a mill and they follow the same contour and curvatures and stuff to get the same piece of wood. So when you use the PVC, which is flat, they come a certain stock size, which is like, I mean, we don't buy it at Home Depot, but they, they don't typically come in a four, four inch by four inch piece or three by four, or whatever. Really comes in a one, one inch stock, which is like three quarter inch thick. But the piece of wood that we have could be inch and a quarter and things like that. It's not typically manufactured that way, but wood, you can actually get it cut milled to the exact size that you need to replace it so it matches exactly. Uh, but we have not used plastic at this point, but we may, PVC, but we may consider in the future for the simpler pieces, uh, but it's, it's challenging. Also thermal expansion is a little different between wood and, and, and PVC. So it's it's those are some of the concerns because if you put if you don't replace all of it with PVC, you put PV, uh, PVC on top of wood when it's string, the 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 the, the, the silicone caulking in between can expand and contract different rates uh, between the the PVC and wood, so it creates more gaps in the future. So those are things that we have to look at, but we have not changed to PVC yet. Okay, this is my concern. I have I have many people in my family who are carpenters and do woodwork and, and things of that sort, no, sir, such. I can't stop and I can sleep. I just think because this is a historical site, it's our city hall. Um, I don't, I'm, I'm gonna vote for it, but I really would not even like us to consider PVC as this is a historical site. I would like, if it's possible, to keep it in in the way in which it was built. Um, I know, you know, there's trends and stuff, but when you start adding PVC with wood and stuff like that, it, it get a little tacky for me, for me. Um, and so I, I really would hope that we could maintain and keep up the grandeur of the building um, with the original architect and the original work, woodworking. That's all I wanted to say. I, I thought I heard you, but I was like, I didn't think I heard you clearly. So thank you no, for okay. Yeah, that's, that's a good point, Nikki. Thank you. Brian. I'll be quick this time, I promise. Um, I'm, in, I'm in total support of the Coppola. I, I guess I'm just surprised, like, are you guys running it? Like, is there nothing to do with inflation here? I'm surprised you wouldn't have more of these, like, overruns. And, again, I, I, I'm totally in support of this, but, like, you know, we can't bankrupt vendors trying to do good for us and make our city look good. So it, is this going to be, I guess that's my other question is like, are we going to feel more of these kinds of things coming down the road because of the increased costs of supplies or is this just a one-off? That's all. Thanks. I, it's, 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 um, I think you got to look at different things. I think, uh, I think for the school construction projects, the economy and the pricing is reflected when we get the bids back from the contractors. So when we talk about once they got the bids in, those prices are fixed. So what we find here, it's the existing condition of the wood that generated these changes. So it's not because of material costs. Uh, you know, if they, if they bid $100,000 for a project, they are responsible to hold it for $100,000 for it. But then, um, but you know when you do change orders, it's it's very challenging. I mean, a lot as everybody knows, you know what everybody they contracted one more for it, so we have to negotiate and 
and, and, and work and get get unit pricing to see what the wood cost is and stuff like that. So it's not a, a you know it's not like they give us a price we just take it. We go back and forth with them uh, substantially to to negotiate those pricings. Um, so and then there are things that you know they suggest that we should do, and then you know we actually get. It's, for the lower portion of the, the cupola I, I mentioned before that we added to the project, we actually went out and get another painter to come in to give us a price without just taking their number for it. So we do a lot of evaluation. So, so it's, um, um, I think what you see here is that it's, it's really existing condition of, of wooden structure, just like an old wooden house kind of thing. Once you, once you open up something, you find stuff and that's what the challenge is. is. Um, so I don't I don't think this is a play this, this is a project that is, that's because inflationary or supply chain issues and stuff that ge generate this change of it. It's really it's just it's a, it's an old wooden structure that's subject to great weather up there, uh, and, and the type of wood. I mean, you, from the ground you look at those panels, you figure it's a, you know one by something. It's like an inch and a quarter thick pieces of wood. So when it checks and crack, it's a huge gap in between. So you can fill it this time. And then you paint it over, you don't see it from the ground. But next time I go up there 10 years from now, I won't be up there 10 years from now. <laughs> but 10 years from now, <laughs> that panel may need to be replaced, but there's no, yeah. So it is, it's very challenging. I, I think the reason, again, this level of detail is that, you know, whether, whether you know, you member, member of council be around, to, you know, still volunteer your time 10 years from now, every 10 years or so, this is going to come up. So it's a, it's a repeated thing. This is the third or fourth time, third time I did this. Uh, so it's it's um, it's a lot of money, uh, but it's an element of city that's identifiable to the city, so it's important. Uh, but it's very hard to avoid this cost, you know. Absolutely, eighty-year-old building, nothing to be yeah. surprised about. Thanks, Alan. Sure, Barbara. Um, yeah, thanks, Tom. Uh, yeah, I just want to add that historic preservation um, is really important um, for our city. And this is, you know, it may, maybe not particularly historical, uh, but as has been pointed out, it is a focal point and uh, we want to, uh, you know, do the best that we can with that kind of preservation and that costs money. And I completely agree with uh, Ms. Ayers that uh, we don't want PVC <laughs> if we're preserving something really important to our city. Um, I, I, I totally agree with that. So uh, I fully support this. Thank you. Okay, uh, any more comments or discussion? Seeing none, I'll call for a vote. All in favor? Uh, it is unanimous. I want to call for opposition. All right. Uh, that is the end of the uh, official business. Alan, we have one more item, right? Yes, uh, I would like to uh, request committee consideration of suspension of rule to take up a very small item. Uh, the item is about Norwalk Police Headquarters. It's the gasoline dispensing station. Um, and we have a, 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 a settlement agreement with the DEP in terms of uh, environmental testing and monitoring. Well, Alan, before, before you go on, I, I, just, I do have, I just pulled up the email from, I guess, Darren. So I'd like to make a motion to suspend the rules to add the follow this following item. Authorize the mayor, Harry W. Rilling, to execute a consent order with DEEP relating to vapor recovery, testing requirements for the police headquarters gasoline pump station. So I made that motion all in favor. Uh, any, any opposed? No, okay, unanimous. Thank you. Okay, now, I'm sorry. Yeah, I just want to introduce a little bit so that you know the public knows that why we're suspending the rule. I guess you get it. So, Police headquarters. We have a gasoline dispensing station, which is a gasoline pump. <clears throat> uh, it's a small one, it's a small system. It's one tank and um, uh, it's put in as part of the original building in 2003 or four. Um, the, this DEP required two testing, stage one and stage two. Stage one is at the pump itself. Sa stage two is at the tank. So we've been doing stage one, stage two testing for since two, since it's open until 2017, when the state said that we no longer need to do stage two uh, testing. And stage stage one testing is only required when you exceed 10,000 gallon a year. So in 2007, we were I'm not sure exactly, but 
between 2007 2018 we are below 10,000 gallons a year so we did not do we did not do stage one stage, stage one testing but since we, once we don't do it we just we, it's not a decision it's just that once we skip one year we don't remember to do it again so we range just between 9,000 9, thousand somewhat gallon a year to like less than 11,000 gallon a year. So we right at the hover back and forth within the limit. So for five last five years, we haven't been doing stage one testing. State came to us, DEP came to us and say, by the way, you guys have a violation. You haven't done it for five years. And we agree with them, but our records show that some years not exceeding 10,000 gallons. So, so but they've been very, they, they were very good working with the city with us and so there is a technically there's a fine of a thousand dollars a year. So for five years, five thousand dollars. Based on our presentation of the issues to them, they have reduced it to three thousand dollars for total uh, uh, penalty in a way. Um, so we have we have since starting I think a couple of months ago we got back on testing stage one, regardless of whether we're under ten thousand or above because we don't want a violation and. Uh, about I think it's two months ago we did a, a service call and testing. It cost us thirteen dollars, thirteen hundred dollars for testing. So, in any event, so what we are presenting tonight is a it's a the state calls it a consent agreement. So it's just agreeing that we are in violation. We are willing to pay for the fine. Uh, that's all. And the reason why I bring it to council is because it require the mayor's signature. Um, again, it's altogether all three thousand dollars. For the last five years, I think that's about it. So, if, uh, if the committee recommended the approval, then we will we'll, uh, submit it to the council in two weeks. One week, but, but Mr. Burnett, Greg. Yes, thank you, Chairman Livingston. Uh, Alan, I just uh, just want to get clarification that that what we are approving is the is, is the amended fine. But there's no uh, admission of us doing anything environmentally wrong. Um, we, we just didn't do the testing, um, but we have started doing the testing. Is that correct? I mean, I because when you when you hear that we got a fine, you know, individuals might jump to the fact that we might be in, you know, creating some kind of environmental situation. And I just want to make clear, if, if, if in fact it's true, that that is not the case. We, we just, yeah. when we did the testing, we, when we did the testing, did we test okay? I guess maybe that's a better question. I will, <clears throat> your question is very specific. So I want, I, don't, I want to make sure I get the answer correctly. Okay. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll tomorrow or Friday, Council meeting is not next week, it's the week after. Right. So what I'll do is I can follow up information for right. about two two. No, it's next week. council meeting is next week. It's the 13th. Oh, it's 13 next week? Oh yeah, next week. See what happened when I'm having fun. <laughs> <laughs> it's next week. Right. Okay. Um so I'll 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 follow up the information to you. Uh, I think it's similar to like a um, you know, your car emission testing. You know, if you don't, you don't do it. There's like a twenty dollar fine kind of thing. It's, it's, it's. Um, I'm not sure you. Um, we. Um, let me, let me get the report. Let me go through a report that the that the testing company does and what it what it says. And uh, I'll I'll read through the uh, the uh, consent agreement again. Uh, Darren has read through it, and she he did the legal team. Uh, Darren does not have a concern about the mayor signing it, or I guess in a way he. I don't believe he feel that there's a mission or anything like wrongdoing or, or polluting anything. Uh, but at the same time, I'll, I'll, I'll look at it and I'll, answer the, I'll get you follow-up answers to those questions. Thank you, appreciate it. Any other questions or comments? Okay, if not. Just, uh, oh, sorry. Go ahead, go ahead Barbara. I, I thought I hit my raised hand. Um, just, um, and maybe I missed something, you may have uh, covered with this already, but were there any re other requirements from the state uh, that we need to abide by uh, in this consent order? Or is that something you can share with it us? Is, it's really you know, just a fine. Okay, you know, all right. I, I have to, um, the, I have to copy a consent order. This, this came up on last Thursday, right before I went on vacation. So I have that information and, and um, uh, I'll, I'll forward to I forward to the member committee tomorrow morning. 
Okay, thanks. Okay, um, there's no other discussion. I'll call for a vote. All in favor? And that is unanimous. Okay, thank you. All right, Alan, anything else? No, that's it. Anything else from the members of the committee? If not, I'll ask for a motion to adjourn. Thank you, Ms. Ayers. All in favor? Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Alan. Good night. Thank Have you. A good, night. good night, everyone. Thanks, Sam.